Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. You're listening to Lunchtime Movie Review from LunchtimeMovieReview.com. And we are the children of the 80s. Welcome back to another episode of Lunchtime Movie Review, the podcast where we look back at some of our childhood favorites and see if they stand the test of time. I'm Bobby, and with me is part of our podcast team. Coming out of the rain, I'm Chris. And I'm Patrick. And for today's episode, we are reviewing 1983's Max Dugan Returns, written by Neil Simon, directed by Herbert Ross, and starring Jason Robards, Marsha Mason, Donald Sutherland, and a very young Matthew Broderick in his screen debut. This is the original Max Dugan. (laughs) <laughs> Correct. Even though Correct. it's returns, the original. <laughs> the, this was the prequel to the sequel. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Wanted to clear that up. And, and then this time he goes up against uh, both Penguin and Catwoman at the same time. <laughs> and he and he makes sure he has the the nipples on his on his Max Dugan suit. No, no, no. That's not till Max du- Dugan forever. So that's okay. <laughs> Thank God, because that is not something I want to see from Jason Robards. <laughs> All right, let's start it off with our with our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by The Club, the number one auto theft deterrent in the 1980s. People always make fun of The Club, but how many times have you left your 1950s crappy gray Volvo running while you ran in for a quick cup of joe and you came out to a puff of black smoke as your ride just rode off into the sunset? With The Club jammed into your steering wheel, if that dirty bastard steals the car, serves him right to steer that POS Volvo into the nearest telephone pole. Ever have a Mercedes that up and walked away after a kid's baseball game? With the club, it's like having your own Gestapo sitting in the front seat telling those dirty bastards to go to Heil. And if you have a borrowed motorcycle and your mother forgets the lock and she decides to tie the chains into a slipknot around the bike instead of chaining it up properly, do all the rest of us dirty bastards a solid and bludgeon that dumbass woman with the club so she will never ever do something that stupid again. I mean, come on, wrapping a chain around a bike. The club was designed for all kinds of vehicles. Motorcycles ain't one of them, but it makes a hell of a deterrent when you're barreling down a huge sewer pipe in pursuit of a convenience store robber, and all you have to do is pull up alongside the fleeing felonious fat ass and show him falling vac- volcano stones aren't the only things that, that know how to brain a caveman. So when it comes time to secure that 1980s rent wreck look no further than the club. At least if some dipshit from the 80s talks about that lame-ass clapper in the new millennium, you would have something solid and heavy to break their hands and head when they bring up that shit again. The club. Get one of ours before they get yours. And that brings us to our summary. That is Chris's job, correct? I think your commercial was longer than my summary. <laughs> <laughs> No, not really. All right, Max Dugan returns, the original. It begins in the Los Angeles, California neighborhood of Venice. There we meet the widowed Nora McPhee struggling to raise her son Michael on an English teacher's salary. One morning on the way to school, Nora stops off at a shoe repair shop while inside for less than five minutes. Someone steals her beautiful 1964 clunker of a Volvo because she left the keys in the ignition. Police Lieutenant Brian Costello arrives to the scene to take her information, and he's immediately smitten with her. He then takes her to school as she's now late for the first class and has no way to get there. And also, she seems generally interested in the officer. After school, Nora and Michael look for new cars in the paper, but Nora barely making ends meet as is doesn't really have enough money to buy something worthy. Brian shows up out of the blue and offers her a motorcycle to use that he bought at a police auction. He takes her out around town for a quick spin and a riding lesson. And when he drops her off later, they make a date for Saturday night. Later that night, Nora receives a mysterious call from a man who does not identify himself, but says he's nearby and he must see her now. 
A few minutes later, he shows up and reveals himself to be Nora's estranged father, Max Dugan. He's returned. She has not seen him since before Michael was born. And I think in the film they mentioned that he she hadn't seen him for about 23 or 28 years, if I remember correctly. Besides abandoning Nora years ago, she's on edge because her father is something of a con man, and she doesn't quite trust him. He puts those fears at ease when he starts pulling all the shades down in her house immediately. Max then reveals that his doctor has given him about six months to live, and the bad news is he was supposed to tell him that five months ago. He opens up a briefcase filled with 687,000 simoleons he embezzled from a Las Vegas casino after it swindled him out of land he rightfully bought fresh out of prison six years ago. The money in the case is Nora and Michael's inheritance, but even though she and her son barely have enough money to survive, she wants nothing to do with him or that dirty money. However, Nora isn't that heartless. Max is the only father she has, and so she lets him stay that night. But he has to leave in the morning. In the morning, Michael meets Max, who introduces himself not as his grandfather, but as Mr. Parker. And the two take an instant liking to each other. Nora then agrees to let Max stay just a little bit longer. Over the course of two weeks, Max, as Mr. Parker, will shower the two with lavish gifts a new car, and much-needed home improvements. However, after Brian's first date with Nora is a disaster, Brian becomes immediately suspicious that she has gotten herself into something she cannot handle. He sees many of her new gifts, including $5,000 in cash, that mysteriously plops out of her purse. He begins to question her on how she can have, how she can have all these things as a single mother on a teacher's salary. Instead of telling Brian some semblance of the truth, that her very well-off estranged father is trying to buy himself back into her and her son's life before his life ends in a few months, and it, it is something that she's really not comfortable talking about to a man whom she's only known for less than a week. No, she lies to him instead, thus kicking in Brian's inspector instincts, and he begins to investigate even further. Eventually, Brian learns the truth, as does Michael. Max is actually his grandfather, and both the Las Vegas police and the mob are looking for him for embezzling that money. Max, wanting to protect his daughter, deposits 400000 into an account for her. Very non-conspicuous. <laughs> he then leaves Michael and Nora a video saying goodbye, and a pinky swear to destroy it once they finish watching the video. He slips out in the early morning while everyone is still sleeping. The movie ends at Michael's big baseball game at school. Brian's son, Bill, who was played by, Donner, by Donald Sutherland's real-life real son, Kiefer, pitches against Michael, who is played by Neil Simon's real-life son, Matthew Broderick. I'm pretty sure he's Neil's <laughs> real-life son. And that was not Kiefer Sutherland pitching. No, no, it was not. Nope. He was the drug dealer, wasn't he? That's right. Yeah. Well, I fucked up that joke. It's staying in. <laughs> Michael hits the winning run off of Bill as Mac watches. Max watches from the shadows. He buys Michael's ball from some boys who picked it up off the ground and steals Nora's Mercedes he bought for her. Should have got a club. <laughs> Brian introduces Bill to Nora and Michael after the game, and the four of them decide to head to Pizza Hut for a new lunch. Any new life. Nora tells Brian that Max is headed to Brazil to live his remaining days on a sandy beach, which puzzles him. He can no longer tell if Laura is lying to him or not. Nora and Michael head back to their car only to find it gone. Max honks and waves goodbye as he drives off into the sunset. Don't forget to mail your doctor those extra cigars, Max. He's expecting them. The end. That was longer than the movie. Yeah. Well, it was all the dramatic pauses. <laughs> And, and fucking up the joke. Yeah, that and too. Up the, <laughs> I don't know. Those, those white boys, they all look the same. <laughs> Especially the drug dealers, right? All right. Patrick, were there any numbers that you could find on this? Yeah, yeah I found some it's numbers. It's been a long time since that movie came out. Right. 
Uh, Max Dugan Returns was released on March 25th of 1983, the same day as The Outsiders, The Black Stallion Returns, Tough Enough with Dennis Quaid, Bad Boys with Sean Penn, and Spring Break, the same month as My Tutor, Trench Coat, 10 to Midnight, High Road to China, Tender Mercies, and of course, Chris's all-time favorite film, Joysticks. Uh, it grossed... I can't get enough joysticks. <laughs> It grossed over uh, $17.5 million at the box office, was the 40th highest grossing film of 1983, right behind The Dead Zone, Breathless with Richard Gere, and A Christmas Story, and right in front of Valley Girl, All the Right Moves, and Crawl. Yes, Crawl. I had Rotten Tomatoes. How have we not reviewed that piece Uh, of shit? I don't know. It's on my (laughs) Voodoo account, because I assume somebody was going to pick that piece of shit someday, but... Uh, Rotten Tomatoes has it at 75% critics and 68% audience. And that's essentially all the new numbers on Max Dugan Returns. Name that week again. The Outsiders, Black Stallion Returns, Tough Enough, Bad Boys, and Spring Break. Those are some movies that you remember from the 80s, from that time. Two or three of them. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying the same week. That's, yeah. that's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it's, you know, you're... Back in the day, you'd still The Outsiders was not anticipated to be a big hit. Black Stallion Returns wasn't a big hit. Tough Enough wasn't a big hit. Spring Break wasn't a big hit. Bad Boys, I don't remember Bad Boys as being a big hit. I know it got a lot of claim because it kind of is Sean Penn taking mm-hmm. his first dramatic role, but that was a brutal movie in the yeah. theater. But. Will Smith, Martin Lawrence, the worst <laughs> back in the eighties. Don't, don't was a remake. Yeah, they were don't, a little green back yeah. then. Don't forget Tia Leone. That I mean, I couldn't stand her. <laughs> was she in that? Yeah. <laughs> oh my lord! Wrong bad boys, but that's <laughs> beside the point. So, um, since this came out in nineteen eighty three, and you guys were each two years old, um, <laughs> when did you guys actually get to watch this? And uh, and what did you think? Or sorry, uh, who has watched it? Uh, did you watch it in the theater, or did you watch it later on in life? When? I don't think I watched it in the theater. Uh, this was definitely an HBO Loop staple that I saw millions and millions of times. I will say that I don't think I've seen it since it went off the HBO Loop, because I remembered very little of this. I even forgot Matthew Broderick was in this um So I guess it didn't leave a mark on me, because War Games, which came out the same year... Uh, is uh, is almost a treasured 80s classic for me. But this one, even though I have always enjoyed it, it, it doesn't hold the same for me. So I guess it just didn't... Uh, this is not one that resonates over the years, but I saw it way back in the beginning. Well, I apparently thought this was a different movie. <laughs> because <laughs> You got I, it confused with Max Dugan, right? No. Uh, I, you know, I... Max Cable. Yeah. I thought I had seen this film and I even knew that Jason Robards and Matthew Broderick were in this film and having watched it just a couple of weeks ago, this is the first time I've ever seen this film. I, you know, I, really? I, I just presumed wow. I'd seen it and I seem to have this visualization of those two actors together in a scene, but nothing about it was familiar watching it the entire time. So if I saw it, I must have saw it once and quickly forgot it. I knew it was the feature film debut of Matthew Broderick because I remember it because I, like Chris, thought War Games was a phenomenal film uh, when I saw that film. And I remember reading how he had made a, another film called Max Dugan Returns. And I think that film was just ingrained in my head as, OK, that's Matthew Broderick's first film. And and I know I wanted to see it. I just never got around to it. And I watched HBO all the time. And I don't remember this on HBO mm-hmm. ever. Oh, it was on there regularly, yeah. but I. So we're expecting it to be uh, Movie House Memories sometime soon for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I watched it and I cried. I did. I, I really tears of joy, uh, sadness, um, the movie well, being over, well, as well as losing about an hour and a half of my life. But you know, that's... Oh, this one actually has a memory uh, that I'll, I will never forget of movie watching was I had just turned 18. I just graduated high school in, in 83, and I, I'm very young looking for my age and definitely was coming out of school. And my when I went to the theater with my best friend, we went to the Kaiser Cinemas and to see – Blue Thunder, which was an R-rated movie that came out the same week, or it was it was out the same time, but we we got there to the to the concession stand to pay for our 
our tickets and I had forgotten my wallet at home. And so we were like, well, you know, I really am 18. I honestly, I turned 18, like whatever it was two months, three months ago. And of course, looking young and in Oregon, the, at the time R rated is, I think it still is 18 years old. It wasn't 17. And so I tried to tell her the truth. I wasn't even lying. And I, couldn't go to the movie so we had to pick something else either drive home which would have missed the the movie time or just pick a different movie so whatever was there i just said i told the the lady behind the counter i said what's up next she says max dugan returns which neither of us have ever heard of before so we went in and watched that instead and ended up watching blue thunder later on that week but uh, i did like this movie when it came out in the theater i i very much enjoyed it but uh um, and then watched it on HBO forever. I actually ended up buying – I have the DVD, which is extremely difficult. Not not difficult anymore on eBay, but it's very expensive to find. When I got it, it I had never seen it on DVD before. So it's it's a it's a hard one to find but uh, – or was. But anyway, um, that was my history with this movie. So um, what did you think of the actors? Let's start with, since we've got uh, Jason Robards is the title character of Max Dugan. Patrick, what did you think of old Max slash Jason? I, you know, I like Jason Robards. He's a very comfortable actor. I know he won two Academy Awards, uh, one for All the President's Men, and I don't know what he won the other one for right now off the top of my head. But, Gone with the wind, pretty no. sure. <laughs> <laughs> he, he seems foreverly grizzled. But uh, he, he, I mean, he just seems, he just, you know, he makes me feel comfortable in uh, with a film when I see him on the screen. He, he's very casual in his delivery. Uh, he, he's not required to stretch too much in this film. Uh, you know, I kept wondering is, okay, he's supposed to be a con, art, con artist. I, I was waiting for a twist of that this isn't really her father or, um, you know, that he's not really sick or <laughs> I kept waiting for something big to happen and it never, it never delivered. He was being, it appeared to have been sincere throughout the entirety of the film, but I liked him in the film. I, I don't have a problem with, uh, Jason Robards. That's not where I thought fault lied with this particular film. I thought he did a pretty good job. And it was Melvin and Howard, wasn't it? No, that was came it? out like 1980, I want to say that. I know he was nominated for Melvin and Howard. Oh, I thought he won it. Okay. But uh, now I'm going to have to look it up. You're going to drive me crazy. But Sorry. <laughs> you looked that up. Uh, Chris, what did you think of Jason? Well, he has some great one-liners in this film. You know, as a kid, I definitely didn't catch his humor in this one. I was just, uh, I think I was about 11 years old when this came out. And so that a lot of his one-liners just flew over my head. The, the joke with the cigars. You know, he's, he's not sentimental. Um, how do I know you have six months to live? Well, we can sit and wait. I mean, he was very droll in this final mortality that he was facing. And I thought he was great. Like Patrick, the my issues in this film do not lie with Jason Robards. Julia is what he had won Best Supporting. He won two Best Supporting Actors in a row. Uh, all the president's men and then in 1978 julia he was nominated again for melvin and howard uh in a, his best actor in a supporting role in 1981 but he had were those the only nominations he's ever had only those three, three academy award nominations he wow won. okay hmm. he's a good actor i'm surprised at that uh i i agree with both of you guys i i really liked him in the the movie i and honestly i think he was probably the most natural of the characters i know as as unnatural as his character was i thought he he pulled it off pretty well and i really love the one-liners that he was zinging back and forth I, I thought he was the most believable of when he was speaking like that i and again i agree i think he was probably one of the strongest parts of the whole movie and the fact that he he delivered his max dugan the I, I don't want to say he was reformed because he really wasn't a reformed prison person. But at the same time, he came out and he was trying to do the right thing in the end for a lifetime of neglect for his daughter. So I think I really liked I liked his arc pretty well with with this story. I thought it was a little more fitting than some of the other characters that, that were coming across, uh, which brings us to our next person on the list, which is Marsha Mason or 
the soon to be ex Mrs. Neil Simon in her fifth Neil Simon movie. What do you guys think of her? Well, you know, I really liked her in Christmas Story and Slapshot, um, playing the mom. <laughs> She was wonderful in those two. I'm sure. Same I'm sure. same actress, right? <laughs> Maybe oh, not. that's great. No, uh, she was she was fine. I think that I enjoyed her more at the beginning, where she was this um, where she was this dedicated teacher who didn't mind living paycheck to. Well, she didn't like it, but you know, she. I thought she was believable as a, a teacher living paycheck to paycheck, doing the best she could uh, by herself with her son as a widower. Um, you know, once Max showed up into her life, I mean, this this film is very '80s. Money can buy you happiness at the drop of the hat, sort of theme that a lot of 80s films have and so that you know that's one of my criticisms and i think her performance goes south when she starts basically accepting her father's gifts when really in the end all she ever wanted was her father's love so you know it was a little her story was written a little weird to me but the actress was fine although any actress i think could have portrayed it especially ralphie's mom (laughs) (laughs) Patrick, what do you think of Ralphie's mom? Uh, I've never been a huge fan of Marsha Mason. Uh, I, I, I think she's a very average pedestrian actress. And this role, I, I, she kind of annoyed me. She was the actor, the actor in the film that frustrated me the most is that she was so wildly inconsistent and she had a constant state of exasperation. Uh, I guess uh, that it's just, <laughs> yeah. that it was just starting to wear on me that, you know, it's just, I, I didn't, you know, it's like make it, pick a lane and choose in it. You don't, you want to be involved with his life. You don't want to be involved in his life. You, you want to keep the things. I, I don't want any of this money. It's, you know, it's dirty money. It's dirty money, but I'm going to go drive the car and I'm going to do this. It's just, it's like, okay, I, I, it, it just, I didn't, the character wasn't very defined for me as compared to, uh, Jason Robards, which was a steady performance, she seemed to be just all over the page and a little bit uh, scenery chewing to me. Well, she was very honest in the beginning of the film. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then she immediately starts lying to this officer. She really had no reason to lie to him. As I mentioned in the summary, she could have just said, look, my father came into my life who's been absent. He's causing some drama. I've only known you for about a week, and I don't think it's any of your business, but I would like to pursue a relationship afterwards. Um, if she was that honest of a person and a teacher that she was portrayed at the beginning of the film, she could have gone that route. I mean, film's over within 20 minutes, but yep. <laughs> it's not consistent with who they established her as in the first moments of this film. Yeah, and I think that that's what I, I what I see too in her character. Because I, I I do I like her in specific roles, but she reminds me a, a, a whole lot of Rebecca Pigeon, who's married to or was married to David Mamet. In her delivery of role of lines, she would get these plum roles of these dialogue heavy stories and her delivery was so fast, so fast. She always had the one liner zingers coming back no matter what. And it was. And it was too staged to me, and I think that same, that came across here as well. Is that her lines, as uh, she she delivers them fairly effortlessly, but at the same time she comes across as she knows what's coming, so she knows the perfect retort. And I think that that's really that that's a little hard for a character of her. Well, for me to be to believe her as somebody that is struggling, and then all of a sudden, like you guys are saying, she gets the money handed to her, and all of a sudden her life just alters so dramatically, and she's kind of okay with it after she gets her perfume, and all of a sudden she's now okay. My dad's back in my life, and and all is well. So yeah, I will I say th- five thousand in cash would change my attitude a bit too. <laughs> It's just the fact that that she was. I, I agree with you guys. I liked her better in the beginning of the movie, but I also very much liked her at the very end of the movie, where she just went, "Listen, this is the way it is. Uh, he's he's going to get away. I'm going to let him get away while I watch my son play baseball because I'm a mom," and and I liked that. So that that was a, a, at least a, an end for her that I that I appreciated. What kind of a dad was Brian then if he's not even cheering for his real life son who's a drug dealer, letting him sell drugs <laughs> instead of playing a sport and fucking up for, my joke? <laughs> he's cheering for the wrong kid. His yeah. th- that isn't his kid. Which does bring us to Brian. What did, since you brought him up, brought him up, Chris? What'd you think of this lame ass dad that's a, a cop that 
can't call his own kid by his right name. Well, I like Donald Sutherland a lot, but the tone of his character was a little off to me. Even when I watched this on uh, HBO as a kid, you know, I couldn't put it into words what bothered me about it. But as an adult, I I just think that he was for not for not knowing this woman for very long. He was overly suspicious. I think, you know, th- this is just a, a woman that he had just met, and he's he's looking to surveil her it's almost stalker like surveil her and her life staking her out i mean sure after he dove into it a little bit more he had good reason to but as as a just a general cop uh who i think he just investigated uh car theft maybe is that what he said in the film yeah no. or the, the tone of his character just did not fit to me something was off the whole time Patrick, you deal with police all the time. What do you think? <laughs> uh, well, it it does not seem that realistic in the fact that she's going to get a detective involved that quickly who's also going to get that personally involved in an investigation. But I, I kind of agree with Chris. It's kind of weird that, you know, I think of Donald Sutherland uh, as kind of more, especially in the late 70s, early 80s, as more of a leading man. And he's definitively a supporting role in this film. I don't really get to a sense of who he is i just he seems kind of creepy to me because i agree with chris is it goes automatically suspicious and i know that the the thought is is like well i'm a policeman of course i'm going to be suspicious yeah you're also a policeman and you normally you're going to be suspicious from the get-go and you weren't suspicious of her from the get-go and you start falling in love or becoming romantically involved with her and it just I, I don't know. Something uh, something de- definitely felt off. Plus, I just didn't th- think that Donald Sutherland had a lot to do. You know, he just he he was kind of like trying to fill two roles at once: the boyfriend and the cop on the you know kind of trying to play catch up with Max Dugan, even though he didn't know who he was trying to play catch up with. But uh, it just seemed poorly written for that character. Have him bust Michael for hanging out with the drug dealer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, make make uh, uh, Grandpa teach him a few lessons that he's learned in the pen. Could have been a very different <laughs> film. Uh, have the well, kid win a major award or something. Come on. Don't just give it to him. <laughs> when I watched this movie, the only time I'd ever seen Donald Sutherland before this was I, I hadn't seen Animal House yet, believe it or not. At least not the R-rated version. But I did watch Dirty Dozen, which was when he was one of those oddball prisoners. And then he comes into this and he like you said, Patrick is you know, he was a leading man that I didn't know him as a leading man. I just saw him as a supporting character, but I saw his character as he was forced to play catch up with Max Dugan the entire movie long. A capable police officer, obviously as capable as he was portraying in the movie, would have solved this thing in the first day. But he he was stalker-like. He was basically – he went too far with a client or whatever. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't know what they're called, a witness, uh, a, a victim. Uh, he went too far too fast with her, I would think, from a professional standpoint, and I think it just kind of – kind of took me uh, took me a while to warm up to him being that way i just never really took him as took him seriously as a real life police officer but i also know that this was a script written by a very word heavy screenwriter and i think that's part of it as well had you it seen also, him in kentucky fried movie at that point no i hadn't seen kentucky fried movie until the mid 90s so there were there was lots of movies that I never saw. Clute, I didn't even see that until I want to say that was that was uh, early '90s that I saw that. Um, but he just he wasn't a leading man to me when Invasion I watched of the Body movie. Snatchers. No, I never saw that movie. I still haven't seen that movie. Yeah. Mash. The what's that? Mash. Mash. Oh yeah, I saw him in Mash. But I again, that's an oddball character. He's he's kind of an odd guy he's great he's wonderful in it but he was an odd guy and i think that that was you know i def oh kelly's heroes he was he pretty was. good in lost boys <laughs> <laughs> well and even in animal house you know i saw his bare ass so that was about the extent of what i saw out of him there but he was always that odd character and in this one he's supposed to be the straight laced police officer and i just didn't believe him there and i think that that was a struggle for me 
But speaking of struggles that you guys have, uh, we have Matthew Broderick as our fourth and final person in his movie debut as Michael the Sun slash drug taker slash baseball <laughs> wannabe. Uh, what would you think of him, Patrick? Uh, he's okay. you, met, you met him, right? Yes, I've actually met him once. He's a very, very pleasant guy. I unfortunately saw him late at night when he was – doing a play in San Diego. So uh, he was tired and Ernie Sabella was bringing him in to introduce him to everybody at the store since Ernie rented there all the time. So he's, he was a very, very nice guy. Um, I didn't bother him too much. Um, I definitely would not have walked up to him. I loved you and Max Dugan. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, who taught you how to swing a bat? Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> that was um, pretty good. But uh, real life. Pit- 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 yeah. Uh, you know he's he's okay. He's not asked to do a lot in this film. Oh, kind of like Marsha Mason, his character seems to be wildly inconsistently written. Um, uh, I, I she's kind of bothering me with what he wants to do. I, and, and even with the screenplay, it's like, you know, is he supposed to be becoming a bad kid or is he not supposed to be becoming a bad kid? It's like they hint at things, but they never really fully flush it out. Which is weird because it's not an extra- extraordinarily long film. I think they could have spent more time, you know. If you if you want to do it, but why even introduce that kind of drug dealer aspect that he's hanging out with? If unless you were going to do something with that, but he he's okay. Definitely, you can tell it's one of his first roles. But uh, I liked him much better in War Games a few months later. He still got the Matthew Broderick mannerisms already down. Uh, <laughs> I see glimpses of Ferris Bueller in him. Yeah, it, it's pretty funny to watch. And I guess uh, Neil Simon loves Matthew Broderick. Because uh, what else did he do? Biloxi Blues. He starred in the stage play of uh, Brighton Beach Memoirs. Right. I guess by the time they made that film, he had kind of aged out of the part for that Brighton Beach character. But that's why I joke that uh, he was Neil's real life son. Yeah. So um, I think he did the stage play for Biloxi Blues as well. well did he? Yeah. 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 He did a series I, of them for uh, Neil Simon. Oh. I think he did the trilogy, all, all three of them. We need to do Biloxi Blues and um, Brighton Beach Memoirs. I, I enjoy those films. Brighton um, Beach didn't didn't age well. No, <laughs> no. Uh, Biloxi Blues is still good, but yeah, Brighton Beach. We'll, we'll is do kind of... we'll do Sandlot instead. But um, <laughs> but no, I, I it, it was a very standard pedestrian role for Matthew. He wasn't asked to do much. War Games, he was much better, and you could tell that he was going to be a big star in War Games. And this one, it was pretty much an interchangeable teenage kid that was playing the role. So you think Kiefer could have done better? He definitely could have done better. <laughs> I mean, the drug dealer. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, Kiefer can hang from a bridge with a bunch of people. <laughs> and Matthew, he's just going to run from pterodactyls in the sky. Right. I don't know what that means, really, but... but. <laughs> Since I saw him in the theater uh, the week that this came out, or the second week that this came out, I did see him winning his screen de- screen debut, and I really loved him then. I thought he was fantastic. I still think he was a little bit of the... He played a little bit younger teenager than he was, and I think that I, that came across a little bit sometimes when he was delivering his lines. It was like he was a little too goofy when he delivered it. It wasn't quite realistic. But I also see that they were trying to give him a, an arc of basically struggling with mom, a single mom, to all of a sudden the world is his oyster and you know, paying – giving the cabbie a $100 bill or whatever he gave him to just for dropping him off at the house off of his wad of, of cash. So you know, I think that he had a, an arc that was difficult for most – well, for anybody that all of a sudden comes into a lot of money that has had to struggle their whole life. So I, did, I didn't think he was unbelievable. I do like the fact he was supporting his mom, and I thought that I liked their friendship, uh, that their relationship between the two of them, that they mm-hmm. treated each other similar to a, a mother and, and son would that were struggling with one another. They were helping each other get dressed and, and making dinner and – that that kind of stuff was kind of fun to me, and I really liked their banter when the the vehicles were stolen. I just loved his response whenever something you tight you you wrapped the chains around the bike <laughs> was a great. However, he delivered it was perfection. I just loved it because it was just you got to be kidding. You're the teacher, you know. Why would you do something that dumb? 
So I did like that part of him, but he, it, it was a screen debut. I see that. I see it was a very strong. I thought it was a strong debut. I obviously War Games. He's way better, but he also that this was his first time in front of a camera. The next time came out, he was ready. So I really, really did like him in this in this go ahead you know max dugan is smart enough that he bought that boy everything but a computer because he knows what kind of trouble that (laughs) kid would get into if he ever had one that brings us to the director uh and or writer what'd you guys think of these guys i mean this is uh, you've got a very seasoned director who's who's done a lot of stuff and then you have the writer who has written his movies or, or his screenplays are considered legend definitely in the theater and a lot of them have won awards as film what do you guys think of neil simon and uh nor and what is his name ross herbert ross herbert, herbert ross what do you guys think of him chris either one of them the hell is herbert ross made that uh i'm trying to think well, he's made stuff like steel magnolias it's not really a something that i like or was that a my, oh, right, I forget what he did in no, that. He did Steel he Magnolias. Did. He did My Blue Heaven. He did True Colors. Uh, uh, I love My Blue Heaven. That's a great yep. film. Uh, Sunshine Boys, Goodbye Girl, Pennies from Heaven. A very Ooh. underrated film in the 90s, Undercover Blues. Out- yep. Oh, I like that one, yeah. yeah Secret out- of My Success. Secret of My um, So, yeah, he actually has made a lot of films that I just didn't realize he made. I, I know, um, um, I keep on wanting- call him neil diamond in my head i don't know why i keep doing that (laughs) but neil simon is the one that uh, i have more of an affinity for the odd couple like we mentioned biloxi blues um brighton beach memoirs which maybe i have to hate now according to bobby um (laughs) but no it's it's jonathan silverman he just it was his first um, and then now that you know him he's not as fun but I would say most of Neil Simon's stuff is is pretty solid for me, even if it's subject matter that I don't really care for. I enjoy his his look on life, his wit, his humor. I mean, he wrote a lot of these one-liners for Max Dugan, you know, and The Odd Couple is great. Seems like old times, I believe he wrote. Uh, one yes. of my favorites uh, from back in the day, another HBO loop classic. So uh, I have nothing bad to say about Neil Diamond. He's great. <laughs> Neil Diamond. <laughs> about uh, see, damn it! I got myself going on about uh, Neil Simon. Well, it, that's because they both killed hookers in Reno. Only Neil Diamond wrote a song about it. So. <laughs> She's a lady, Patrick. <laughs> what do you think, Patrick? Uh, you know, Herbert Ross is—he's got some hits and misses. He's got more hits than misses. He, there's a lot of films I like, and we went over the laundry list of them. I—I I, I know one that's not real popular, but I always, for some reason, loved *My Blue Heaven*. I love that film. I love Steve Martin's performance <laughs> yep. in it. *Undercover Blues* is an undiscovered gem. That is, uh, that film just cracks me up from beginning to end. Even right now, just thinking about it's Morte, Morte. <laughs> it's a, hey, Morty, how you doing? <laughs> but you know, early Stanley Tucci. But it, you know, uh, Neil Simon. I really like his early stuff, uh, like *Odd Couple*. And I, you know, it seems like old times was I, I I have to I haven't seen it since the '80s, so I don't know if I'd still like that. I liked it at the time, but I really liked Chevy Chase and Goldie Hawn when I was a kid. This one doesn't resonate as well with me. I don't remember liking Brighton Beach Memoirs that much. I liked Biloxi Blues a little bit, but once again, I haven't seen that in probably about 20 years as well. Uh, there, you know, it's he's I, he's. A, a genius. Don't get me wrong. It's just I don't think I think his stage plays probably are better than the film uh, adaptations of some of those uh, some of those stage plays because I just don't think it necessarily works quite as well on film. And this would be one where I I just think this one is kind of it's like he, he wrote a role for Marsha Mason and that's that's what this why this film even existed uh, so that she would continue to have a career. But then she it got rid of him and then. She didn't have a career, and he made better mm-hmm. films. <laughs> yeah, I, I I see that with Neil Simon. I Neil Simon to me is one of my all time greats because I, as somebody that has written s- screenplays and knows how hard it is to write 
just write something, let alone write something amazing. And he pulled it off many, many, many times. I mean, he's a legend in in theater, and he, his screenplays for movies, uh, even though they were brought most of the time, they were brought almost from theater to the to film. I don't. They always got watered down somehow most of the time they didn't show up as well i don't know if it's miscast or or what was going on the direction wasn't as great not sure but i neil simon is an awesome writer to me but i have to agree i think max dugan returns is not one of his best movies i think that he i can see kind of the the strings being pulled today that i didn't necessarily see in 1983 when i was new to seeing neil simon movies i had i hadn't seen most of the ones you guys talked about i did see the odd couple and i'm not sure i saw much anything else up until that time and then i've watched many since i'm surprised you haven't seen seems like old times i've seen them since i didn't see them at the time when they came out but yeah like uh, Brighton Beach Memoirs, I loved when that came out. I really loved that movie. When it was on HBO Loop, I watched it all the time. And then I just watched it two years ago, and I, I sought it out on DVD because I couldn't find it anywhere else. And I was somewhat disappointed in, in the viewing today. Biloxi Blues, that's what I, I think the genius of – of Neil Simon is is his vignettes are priceless. He's genuinely a genius in putting people into situations and have them banter their way out. And I really enjoy that part when he gets people talking with with other people or other characters and makes me laugh. And a lot of that is will always stand the test the test of time to me because it's showing wit and uh, wisdom. And I, I just I love the the use of language that that he puts into it so i very much like him herbert ross i think he's a he's a very average director and i think his movies are they come across as very similar in look and and feel i'm not saying he's bad i really like his feel a secret of my success i love that movie true colors which is the almost the polar opposite of these movies that we're talking about these joyful wonderful comedies and then you got true colors where these these Basically, you have this jerk roommate that walks all over everybody to get to the final end. I mean, that was a, a big jump. But I, I, I mean, I like both of them either way. So it's not a not a problem for either one of them. It was just odd seeing seeing wh- where Herbert Ross ended up at the end. But let's go back to the. Uh, we've kind of touched on it, but the likes and dislikes. What did you guys like about? Well, let's. We've we've already. Yeah, what did you like about the movie? You already talked about most of the dislikes. <laughs> what 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 do you like about it, Patrick? Um, I, you know, I, I thought it was uh, more towards Herbert Ross's direction. I thought it was shot well. I thought it was uh, ironically a little short. I thought I was missing gaps of storytelling in this, and uh, and I wish they would have kept a little bit more in there. But I think he keeps a very lighthearted pace. I really like Jason Robards, but that's uh, as I said, is always he's always makes me comfortable when he's in a role. Ultimately, now having seen the film and knowing that there's not really a twist, I think I probably would have been I would have been less suspicious of his character and been more uh, along for the ride for the joyfulness of the, him just wanting to do some good for his family members. Because I spent the entirety of the film. He's, being suspicious he's a con artist something's going on and uh, i think that took away from me truly appreciating kind of the the message of the film uh until the the very end and i I, having seen it and and trust me i'm not running out to go watch it again right now (laughs) but having (laughs) seen it i think if i saw it a second time i probably would just relax a little bit and just enjoy the film and not wait for this dark twist to keep coming that didn't happen so what do you think the message was since you're saying there's a message there? Well, the you know, first it's, it's you know, kind of a message of redemption. He's trying to redeem himself in his daughter's eyes as best he can in the short period of time to establish a, a positive relationship having having years and years of uh, just, you know, no relationship or a negative relationship uh, to start with. I, I you know, the way he's trying to buy you know buy things for her to take care of them disregarding her I, I don't necessarily like that aspect of it but i do 
like the idea that he gives her the choice of what she wants to do, you know, at, at the end. And that I think she's a stronger and more complete character at the end of the film than she is at the beginning because of that brief relationship she had with her father. Uh, and she then there and also to be a better mother towards her own son. And in the same regard that Jason Robards' character, because he gets to be a grandfather, he gets to do something for Matthew Broderick, which is to show a, how to swing a baseball bat, which apparently he still didn't know by the end of the film. But that's, <laughs> that's a separate issue. I mean, the only per, only ball he's going to hit is if one one thrown by Tim Robbins. But that's that's. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that so that's what I saw in it. Well, first off, I want to say that I think the moral of this film is: if you ever want to make really good pancakes. Get your ass tossed into prison for six years. <laughs> That's what I come come away from this film. And use bird's eye. Yeah. But uh, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, Duty Goodman as Blanche living next door. <laughs> How many? <laughs> that, that's my Grease impression. Uh, the, you always have a Gladys Kravitz type character as the neighbor. Uh, I thought she was... She was some nice humor, not really needed, but I still enjoyed seeing her in it. Um, I think that this film begins and ends with uh, with Jason Robards. And that it's what I remember the film, even though I didn't remember a whole lot of lines. I remembered him and he's very grandfatherly, even if he's a con man. I, he comes off great in this film. And um, he he's still even though he's. Um, didn't get everything he wanted. I think he got most of what he wanted. He gets to ride off into the sunset to an uncertain future. And I think that was uh, a good ending to this film that uh, the cop didn't get his man. He got his woman, though. So, you know, win-win. <laughs> but, yeah, that that's pretty much what I remember. I still also want to give a shout-out to all those 80s um, Atari cartridge boxes that were surrounding <laughs> that TV, that projection TV. How much Good is that times. worth right now? Uh, about a buck seventy-five. <laughs> Just go to New Mexico, get that ET cartridge out of the landfill, and the big giant screen TV that uh, that projection TV, the big <laughs> camera. I'm telling you, these early films they give they're they're very nostalgic for early '80s. That uh, oh yeah, that uh, it, it's great to see from time to time in this Venice Beach, California area. Yeah, it was great. With our 4K 3D TVs, and to watch that was hilarious. That was mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah, I, I really Jason Robards is the the end all be all of this movie. I think he's he's where it begins, and obviously he's the title character, and he's also where it ends. And I I like Patrick's response in what is the the final? What's the story about it? it You've got a, a guy who pretty much walked away from his family. He didn't pretty much. He did walk away from his family and left them to fend for themselves. And the only way he can fix that is with very little time left. He's trying to bring some happiness into – and try to he, – he even said so. He's trying to buy – time with his with his family all that he has left he wants to give to them and as superficial as money is he tried to do it in the most genteel positive way and tried to have a relationship in the process where he was trying to be a grandfather and better yet a a father to the daughter that he had, had abandoned so i i really liked that the that was the undercurrent for the entire movie yes there were silly going on you had marcia mason running around never knew which direction the wind was blowing she was going to go that direction always mad at max but i liked the end of the movie i still think the ending of this movie was excellent i think you have two parents that ultimately throw all the political love crap to the side just for a moment of sheer love for their children to cheer for one another. I laughed. I I still laugh out loud when she's like, I'll tell you, you know, you're going to leave when your son's going to pitch against my son and he's going to knock it out of the park. And it was just like, all of a sudden the lights went on for both of them. And it was just, she's cussing at the top of her lungs. And I mean, that was fun to me. It just, that, that made us laugh. And I watched this with my son when he was young. And I remember him always laughing at Matthew Broderick. So not just, 
the swing, but the fact that he enjoyed <laughs> Matthew Broderick's character in that he was always that silly kid that was just – he didn't know what was coming next, but he was always all for whatever the next gift was coming around the corner. So the fact that he had a, a, an arc at the end where he realized it isn't all about the money. It's about that he was had he had time with his grandfather before he was gone forever. So I think that that was a nice touch as well. So yeah, those were the real positives to this, I think. But uh, we've talked about the negatives. You want to keep going on more negatives? <laughs> no, I pretty much expressed no. everything I okay. had to say about it. So let's go around the table and let's talk about what is the uh, – do you believe this movie stands – this is 1983, Neil Simon movie. Does this stand a test of time and what do you think of this movie in general? Patrick, let's start with you. Uh, what I, first I think, time first time seeing it i think that the film is pretty average it's not a bad film it's a nice uh, yeah, my mom would describe it as cute you know that's what she would say and it's cute it's it's all right it's not something i'm gonna it's not gonna stick with me it's not gonna resonate with me for a long period of time but it's not horribly bad it has flaws most films do um but it doesn't it's not to the point where I go, oh, God, I'm, I, what a complete waste of time. And I made jokes at the beginning about two hours of my life I'm not getting back. But uh, I, I didn't honestly feel that way. I, I, I'm i glad I saw it. I, I'm surprised I never saw it before. Does it stand the test of time? No, I don't think it, res- it would resonate with an audience now going back and rewatching it. You know, it's not one that I'd say, is, hey, you have to see this. This is a one of the, the uh, un- undiscovered gems of the 1980s. So... No, I don't think it stands the test of time. Uh, I think it's uh, it's it's cute. That's the best I could describe it. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, how cute is it to you? Well, it's two Ferris Bueller's thumbs up cute for me, I guess. Um, this is like Patrick said. This is an average movie. I, I would give it like two and a half stars. You know, it's right down the middle. It's the Goldilocks of Neil Simon's films. Not too hot. Not too cold. Um, and it's fine. If I'm going to see a Jason Robarts film that is, you know, a little bit more lighthearted maybe, or I wouldn't say lighthearted, but, you know, not like one of his main films, I'm going to go watch A Boy and His Dog. I think that's something, that, the themes that stand the test of time more, especially in today's dystopian uh, type environment. But, you know, this one, it, it's a little dated. It's very much a product of the 80s. Very much a money buys happiness, greed is good, almost sort of thing, theme to it. And um, it's not Matthew Broderick's finest film that year. If this was the only film you saw of Jason Robards, you might not even think of some of his greater films, uh, you know, that uh, I, we've already view, reviewed. So it's, it's just a middle, middle of the road. The other actors, nothing really outstanding. Donald Sutherland, Sutherland, like I said, he's going to do really well in The Lost Boys in a few years, and uh, you'll forget he was ever in this film. <laughs> well, I will somewhat agree with you guys because I, and I, this is it's hard for me to say that because I love this movie. I, I will always love this movie. It's it's going to be part of my my heritage of of, of movie watching. I'll, I'll still watch this again multiple times, probably before I die. But I will agree. This is 80s cotton candy. It, this is all it is, is a very light uh, story that will make you chuckle a, a few times. It didn't age well as far as styles. Uh, it very much is a 1980s time capsule, 1983 specifically, time capsule. And I think that that today's audience would be a harder pressed to enjoy it for the first time. Obviously, Patrick, you're the test audience for that in that it's, if you love Neil Simon, there are better options for you to, to delve into his filmography and watch a much better movie. I do think it's worth watching uh, if, at least once just to see it because it is cute and it is fun and it is enjoyable as unbelievable as it is as 80s greed heavy as it is i i still love this movie and i think it's fun to see the redemption of somebody who was basically an unredeemable character at the beginning of the movie that i mean patrick you said you thought there was the the shoe was going to drop at any time and to ultimately find out that there's no shoe to drop he's just trying to have enjoy the rest of his life with the the people he loves the most and you realize he's not as sinister as you think i really like that about his character and I, and it it redeemed the movie so yes i did i think this movie is worth watching 
I don't think it stood the test of time typically, but I think it as a Neil Simon movie, it's it, it's a middle of the road. It's worth watching, and we'll we'll leave it at that. So if anything it else, ever rained in Arizona, this would be a good Sunday rainy day film. It it makes you happy, doesn't it? I mean, at least it makes you. Yeah. It's a lighthearted, uh, good feel movie. Average good feel movie, but it's still yes. Jason Robards will make you happy. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, that does it for our review of Max Dugan Returns. Please let us know what you think of the film in the comment section on our website and rate it from one to five stars on that page as well. If you have any review requests for movies from the 80s, please send us an email at comments at moviehousememories.com with your name and pick. And finally, if you are the, of the social media persuasion, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. So please give us a follow when you find us. So that's it for today. Until next time, I'm Bobby. I'm Chris. And I'm Patrick. And we have to get out of here, and you folks are invited. podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme music for Lunchtime Movie Review, Fireworks, is provided courtesy of Alexander Nakaranda at SerpentsToSoundStudios.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHM Podcast Network, Lunchtime Movie Review, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted. 